Hello again, it's Beth here, one of the DSNs from the 101 account. Um, we're back with our final video from the 101 Downloaded Conference and this video is um, all of your questions answered. So everything that you sent us on the day in the chat, we collated it all together and got everybody back who spoke um, and got them to tell us all their answers to your questions. So hopefully you will find your answers in this video. If not, buzz us over on Twitter and we will get them answered for you. Hi, it's Amanda. I'm one of the DSNs from the 101 account. And today we have all of your questions answered. So if you asked a question on the day of the 101 downloaded and you're waiting for your answer, here it is. Hello and uh, thank you to all of those who have taken the time to come to the video um, chat that we had uh, going through the presentation on COVID-19 and diabetes and a big thank you for the questions that have come through. We're sorry we we're not able to answer it on the day concerned but we'll try and go through some of them today in this added piece. But one of the questions which has come up repeatedly is about the risk calculator that we spoke about. Now the risk calculator is coming from the Oxford team. We are expecting it to come out pretty much at any moment so to speak. It's being done by the team of Julia Hipsley Cox. And um, so far, as we can see, it looks quite good, looks quite strong. So hopefully it should come out and it's something we, we are all looking forward to as well. Uh, the basic reason being that that will give us an indication as to higher risks, etc. But in the nicest possible way, hopefully we don't have to use it because using it would suggest that uh, we probably do have a second wave and we have got issues with COVID-19 uh, in itself. So hopefully never to be used, but um, it's certainly coming out as soon as uh, feasible. Um, we've got another question about the risk of infection. Now we don't have much data on it. There isn't any indication that if you have diabetes, you've got a higher risk of catching COVID-19 per se. But again, um, there are so many ifs and buts in this whole equation, the advice stays the same. Uh, if you have diabetes, if you don't have diabetes, then it's social distancing, hand hygiene, and masks where it's uh, advised uh, or where it's not possible to do social distancing as much as possible. Another question has been whether the increased risk is just dependent on age or length of diagnosis. And according to the studies that we did, the length of diagnosis didn't seem to be having a bearing. It was more about the age and the level of control. It is slightly counterintuitive to which we all know, but then again, um, we are dealing with a particular condition which we know not much about. So uh, I would say that the studies would suggest that it's more the age around the length of the diabetes per se. Um, uh, another question here is, we're strictly uh, social distancing from uh, everyone. Is she okay to see friends now? Um, and now it's safer. I think it's very much depends a little bit on the infection risks. There is a variation about infection risks around the country. If you wanna have a good view of it, you can visit the Public Health England website or NHS digital website, which gives you an idea as regards infection risk. And as far as I can remember, even on the BBC website, there is a particular tool that gives you an idea what the risks or the infection levels in your area are. I think if it's quite low, then uh, it certainly is something that I would suggest keeping an eye on as it gives an idea as to what can be done safely, what not. But the issues of, of uh, social distancing still continues to be till we have a vaccine until this is eliminated, so to speak, from our society. What about the long-term effects? Again, um, this is a new illness. Everybody's trying to keep in touch with it. There is actually a, a research that has been sanctioned, which is gonna be led by Leicester University. And uh, there is a, um, I think as far as I recall, nearly 10,000 people who had been admitted with COVID. A subsection of that will be people with diabetes. So we will be tracking them. We'll be looking after people who've got type one, type two diabetes, seeing how they have recovered from it. And that will give us a good idea as to uh, where things are at. Uh, one more question. Good to see risks of death being lower for younger type ones. So what about effects of ketones? Um, well, uh, we always stick to the same issues about sick day rules. If you're not well, check your ketones. It's as straightforward as that. Um, and I think the, does it cause more ketosis? Again, we see that in type 2 diabetes, there certainly is more rise of ketones. We haven't necessarily picked up in type 1, 
though bear in mind that the numbers are quite small, I think my advice would be that you check your ketones where possible, where if you feel it's necessary, and the advice to all of primary care and specialists is to make sure that your local patients do have access to type 1 diabetes. Um, uh, what about extra risks of asthmatic patients as well as type 1 diabetes? Again, I think if you look at the data, uh, they're not necessarily additive, but I wouldn't say there's extra risk of picking it up, but does it make it uh, possible that you'd have worse outcomes? Well, I think safety is the main thing. I'm not aware of particular tests done in the field of asthma uh, or background lung disease, so to speak. But again, um, instinctively as a clinician, I would say that if you've got background lung issues, then you need to be extra careful with the whole scenario. So, um, and a last question, which I'll try and answer is, is a child with type one and COVID symptoms more likely to need hospital assistance? Well, um, if you look at admission rates that we have seen, we haven't actually seen a huge spike in admissions per se, though uh, recently there's been a paper out um, uh, talking about slightly higher admission rates and whether that's related to COVID. Uh, it's very speculative at this stage, but I do know that the pediatric bodies, especially the team which does the audits, are keeping a very close eye on this as to whether uh, people with type 1 diabetes are getting more admissions, more diagnosis as well. But in simple, plain terms, again, it goes back to the issues of sick day rules and keeping in touch with the local teams, especially uh, pediatric teams when it's a child concerned, who should be able to give you all the relevant advice to keep on top of things but uh, do children uh, have more severity of illness? All the data, diabetes or no diabetes, would suggest that the more severe affection seems to be more elderly population. That is not to say that younger population don't have it, but it's more skewed towards the elderly population. So hopefully that helps. It's a quick run through about some of the questions um, that I received. And please do, again, visit the... Um, website of uh, Diabetes 101, the YouTube channel for all the talks that are there. And um, if things change, we will keep updating them. But uh, the basic message still stays the same. Stay safe. Try and look after the modifiable factors you can, which is your glucose control and your weight. And I totally appreciate that's easier said than done from behind the desk. Um, but beyond that, there are things you can't modify. And we're all working hard to try and keep the virus at bay. So keep to it. Tell your friends and family to do the same. I wash hands, social distancing, and masks where appropriate. And we keep our fingers crossed for a vaccine. And uh, hopefully we can all then meet again in uh, better times than where we are at the present moment. Thank you very much for your time. And hopefully you have found that useful. Hi, guys. Uh, Rebecca Thomas. Yeah, from the Diabetes 101 uh, downloaded conference. Just wanted to um, upload some video answering some of the questions that you guys had from the conference. Some of them I answered in the chat box, but um, yeah, just thought I'd answer them all on here. So they're all in one place for you guys. So there was a couple of questions around screening um, and when screening would be restarted again. Um, I'm not really sure what's happening in Scotland, but I know that for England, Public Health England have already announced that screening can restart. Um, it is going to be phased, it is going to be prioritised and um, some regions have already started and other regions will be starting again soon. So that's England um, and Public Health England have a blog so they generally update their blog on uh, when screening will start and stop and everything like that. Um, and then for Wales, Wales Public Health Wales announced that uh, screening would restart. That's all screening programmes, so that's cancer screening as well as uh, eye screening. Uh, they're all due to restart over the summer. They're starting with some of the cancer programmes now in July. Um, but hopefully by the end of August, september time, we should have some eye screening um, reintroduced. Obviously, with social distancing, the programmes are going to be at reduced capacity. Um, and so they're going to have to prioritise people coming back in as well. So it, it's going to take them some time to catch back up. But uh, yeah, it, it should all be uh, all sh should all be coming back around soon. Uh, a couple of other questions about screening were about variations. Um, so one of them was about the eye drops. 
So in England and Wales, we would routinely use eye drops um, for screening, and that's because we take two images per eye. Whereas in Scotland, um, they would try to capture images uh, without drops in the first instance, and then if the images are not good enough, then they would take the, the then they would use um, eye drops. It's because they only take one image per eye and we take two images per eye. And so each flash of the camera causes the pupil to get smaller and makes it more difficult. There are differences in eyes. Um, so younger people and people with blue irises, uh, their eyes dilate more quickly, more readily in, um, in darkened environments. Whereas those with older eyes or with uh, brown irises, it takes a little bit longer for pupils um, to dilate, but it, it is really variable. So it's really difficult for um, the screening teams to look at somebody and know how they're going to react and whether or not you know it's going to be quick enough for the to get the appointment through. And um, we have such a high throughput of of appointments, and they all like to run to time. So. Um, Generally, they would use eye drops in England and Wales in the first instance. But if you really don't like them, you could ask to have your images taken without the eye drops. Um, but knowing that if they can't get good enough quality images, they are going to ask you to put the, the eye drops in. So you may be there um, slightly longer than if you just had the eye drops in the first place. There's also questions about the screening letters. Screen letters are different. Um, I mean, England has over 60 screening programmes um, and each programme might have a slight variation on the retinal image, uh, on the screening report letters back to patients. Um, in Wales, we just have the, the standard templates. Um, so everybody at the same grade gets the same letter, unfortunately. Um, there is, I know there is a big call for the information in screening letters to be changed for you guys to have more information for it to be communicated in a better way um there is some ongoing work um around the screening letters and how we can improve these um but it's difficult because different people want different amounts of information so trying to find the balance that um you know is going to be suitable for everybody is a little bit diff difficult so Bear with them, they are trying to change it. Um, hopefully it'll happen soon, um, but we'll uh, wait and see. Um, I also had a couple of questions about retinopathy and reversal of retinopathy. Um, and whether if retinopathy is seen at one screening appointment and then it's, it's not at another appointment, whether the initial one was a false, uh, false positive or false negative. Um, so retinopathy is leakage of fluid, both uh, of blood and fatty fatty material um, from the blood vessels. Um, and these can, once they appear, they can be reabsorbed by the retina, which is usually what happens. Um, and so whether, whether what we see uh, at each appointment is a true reversal or whether it's a point where it's been reabsorbed and nothing else has leaked out. You know, we're, we're not really sure. But um, I have seen many people develop background retinopathy and even pre proliferative retinopathy and then go back to having no retinopathy or having background retinopathy um, and stay there for many, many years after, improve, after improving blood glucose and blood pressure management. Um, and so I really can't stress enough, it is important, especially if retinopathy has developed, that we talk to our diabetes teams and we try and make um, improvements wherever um, that might be possible. Small ones um, would be good, but yeah, if, if it is really important. Um, I also had a few questions about maculopathies. Um, and how quickly these can develop and can they be reversed without treatment and how can uh, a maculopathy be seen at screening but then by the time you get to the consultant um, it's they say there's nothing there there's nothing wrong so this all goes back to what maculopathy is and um, what ophthalmo the ophthalmologist is looking for for treatment so basically maculopathy is just retinopathy 
there has occurred within that macular circle um, that I showed you in my presentation, which is around the fovea area, which is the important part of your vision. Uh, any fatty deposits or blood um, that appears there with an unexpected drop in your vision uh, would be termed maculopathy. Now this is because screening only takes 2D images and the eye is a, is a 3D um, object. Um, so we're looking for things that may signal other changes are going on. Um, but what the ophthalmologists are looking for for treatment is diabetic macular edema. So that's different to maculopathy. This is fluid buildup under the retina, which causes retinal thickening, and that is what they would treat. Now, the, the leakage of the fatty deposits, the exudates, the blood, the hemorrhages, the uh, microaneurysms, these are what we would use as indications that there could possibly be some fluid buildup um, going on in the ret in the macular area, the maculopathy, um, and so this is why we refer you into ophthalmology for further checks. Um, we are aware that mm, about sixty percent um, of the people that we would refer into ophthalmology um, would have uh, another image taken of the retinal thickness and would then be discharged straight back to screening because there is no no thickening there's nothing else happening um and other other the other things may have been reabsorbed into the eye before you um be seen in clinic as well so so changes can be uh transient so they can come and go um uh just like retinopathy can so maculopathy is a similar thing um so if you do get a referral into ophthalmology for maculopathy, just be aware it's for a further test, it's for a further check. We're not saying that there's something definitely wrong with your eye. Screening isn't diagnostic. Um, we're just picking up those changes that might need um, ophthalmology to see you um, a little bit sooner or, or could need some treatment. Um, so could maculopathy be reversed? Yes same as as um as retinopathy without treatment but diabetic macular edema would need treatment that won't uh reverse and for how long it takes to progress there's no definite answer on that because it depends on whether the maculopathy you've got is a single microaneurysm a single blood spot or whether it's multiple fatty deposits and there's lots of fluid around um, so you could be talking several years to months. It it's purely dependent on what the picture looks like um, in your in your eye. Um, I also had a couple of questions about the uh, different risk factors and whether um, one influences more than the other. You know, with the things you can change and the things you can't change, um, and basically. Uh, it's really difficult to isolate out the individual risk factors from each other because people have multiple ones. So um, it's it's really difficult when you're looking at these association studies to say yes that one that one has the most impact and that one doesn't and um, add you know adding them all up differently because it also depends on your genes as well. So that makes the reaction different. Um, but in most, in all, pretty much all the studies, uh, glycemic management and duration of diabetes always come out with the um, biggest associations and have the biggest risk for progression of retinopathy. Um, there was also a question around puberty and menopause. So if puberty and pregnancy are risk factors for retinopathy, could menopause be? Um, the short answer is there's very little studies on menopause um, and again even in the studies with puberty and pregnancy it's really difficult to separate out um, those going through puberty and, or in pregnancy and whether it's um, that stage that they're going through whether it's having an effect on their blood glucose and that's what's having the effect on the eyes um, or whether it's how long they've had their diabetes for or the age that they are or 
you know, uh, and in pregnancy, we generally tend to see um, rapid reductions in HbA1c, um, and that could be having the effect. So it's um, it's really difficult when you're looking at risk factors to isolate one out from the other. Um, and just menopause and diabetes just isn't that well studied. It's, it, there's hardly any literature on it um, itself. So unfortunately, it's a difficult one to, um, to answer. So I was also asking a question about uh, reducing HbA1c and if doing so too quickly um, can cause any damage to your eyes and if so, how, how does this um, actually work? So there have been several studies that have shown that rapid reductions in HbA1c can cause retinopathy that's already there to progress. So if there's no retinopathy there, you're not at risk of causing yourself to develop retinopathy. But if retinopathy is there, then making changes quickly to um, your glycemic management can cause retinopathy to get worse. Now this worsening is usually transient, so after around about 12 months, um, you should be back to your previous stage of retinopathy. So if you have background retinopathy and you got up to pre-proliferative level because you've you've dropped HbA1c too quickly, um, but after 12 months, you, you should be back to the background level. Now, the only problem with this is if you develop proliferative retinopathy or you develop diabetic macular edema, you will require treatment. Um, it, it'll just be what's, what's needed. Um, but my diabetes colleagues, your multidisciplinary team, would want me to point out that the benefits of reducing your HbA1c go way beyond your eyes. Um, and it ha obviously has benefits for everywhere else in your body as well. So... Um, it's a good thing to do. If we can try and do it uh, slowly and steadily, great. If we can't, um, then if you are under an ophthalmologist, you should uh, let them know that you, you, you put on a treatment or something that can cause um, HbA1c to drop quickly so that they can see you more frequently. Um, and it might be worth some extra optician's appointments um, just just in case, just to keep an eye on everything and make sure um, it's all okay. Um, as to why this happens, so there's a theory. Um, it's not proven. Um, but the thought is that um, high glycemia, so hyperglycemia, increases uh, the speed of blood flow through the eye. Uh, so when retinopathy is developing, uh, this causes obviously the blood and um, other leak, other the materials to leak from the from the blood vessels. So this reduces the supply of oxygen to areas of the eye. Um, so, this, so they become what's known as ischemic. Ischemic. Um, so ischemia is just a lack of blood, blood lack of oxygen. Um, so then, when you lower your high blood glucose. Um, this then slows down the blood flow through the eye. So if you do this quickly, um, the eye can't adjust to these changes as well. So this then increases the lack of oxygen in the eye, causing the ischemia to get worse, which causes the retinopathy to get worse. Um, that's the working theory um, that uh, is most popular at the minute. Um, whether that is true is yet to be proven, but it, it seems to uh, to be the best best one that we've got. So two final questions. Uh, one was about sight loss and what do I actually mean by sight loss? Um, is it black blank spots or total blackout or completely variable? And another one was about um, high blood glucose and uh, blurred vision. So the sight loss one, sight loss has many definitions. It is completely variable. Uh, you can get the black spots from laser and bleeding in the eyes. So you've lost some sight, so it is sight loss. It can also mean complete loss of peripheral vision. Um, uh, it could mean loss of nighttime vision. So um, treatment for proliferative eye disease, the laser treatment could cause loss of peripheral vision. Other eye conditions, such as ret retinitis pigmentosa, can cause loss of peripheral vision. Um, 
and even somebody certified as sight impaired or severe sight impaired, they still may have some useful vision uh, which would help them navigate around their environments. Um, and you can also get sight loss in one eye and not in the other. So how much sight somebody would have to sight loss is it really is variable. And then you get other conditions like uh, macular degeneration, which affects your central vision, your reading vision. So you still have really good peripheral vision, but you may not be able to see all the letters uh, in your book or, you know, and to read. So it is a really variable term. Um, unfortunately and then the final question was about um, blurred vision so high blood glucose levels and low blood glucose levels so hyper and hypoglycemia can cause your vision to blur um, this is because it's changing the amount of fluid there is in the lens and it just takes your eyesight um, a little bit of time to get used to it but once you're back uh, within range um, the blurred vision should should go. If you have um, blurred vision for any length of time, then um, please do go see your opticians because you could have some refractive error um, that um, glasses might help with. Um, so that's it from me. I think I've got through everybody's questions that were asked. There were quite a lot. Um, so thank you for that. And um, hopefully I'll see you all soon. Hi everyone, thanks for inviting me back to answer some of the questions that came through on the Diabetes 101 conference day. So um, I'm going to answer the questions that were relevant to my section. So one of the things that came up was whether B, vitamin B12 um, monitoring for people who are on metformin is in any guidance. So yes, it is. Um, the B12 monitoring is advocated by the American Diabetes Association standard of care. Um, and that's the 2020 version of those. and um, what they say is that there should be periodic measurements of B12 and that would be particularly done if there was any signs of anemia or if somebody had peripheral neuropathy. Um, so anemia, if you've got a B12, you can present with anemias and if you have peripheral neuropathy, um, that again can be a problem with B12 um, or it can worsen, it can worsen, or worsen peripheral neuropathies that are already there. So that's that question. Um, the other one was about um, whether in type 1, whether um, whether the metformin is beneficial in the same way that it is beneficial in type 2. So um, I went away and had a look at the evidence around this. Um, so in type 1, the evidence suggests that you do get a reduction in body weight and you get, um, you get benefits to your lipid profile. So that's your fat profile, so all the cholesterols. Um, However, the evidence seems to suggest on the whole, um, it didn't massively improve your HbA1c, so your long-term marker of, of how well um, your blood glucose is going. Um, so that's a, that's a bit of a surprise potentially. So, um, so, so just to recap on that, so the evidence suggests as a whole, um, when they've pulled some bigger studies together, that it can reduce body weight um, and you can get reductions in your lipid profile so you, that's your fats um and but the overall there was no evidence to suggest that you would get an improvement in your in your long term average um blood glucose readings um, so probably from that, I would take away that if you're losing weight um, and you're managing your lipids better, that overall you will reduce potentially some of your cardiovascular risk there. Um, and from that point of view, that would be well worthwhile. Um, next question was about SGLT2. So um, the question was, should all people living with diabetes be on SGLT2s, given all the advantages? And how do we feel about SGLT2s for type 1? So again, um, just pulling some data on that. So SGLT2s, um, looking at adding that in, um, with some licensing problems at the moment. So a lot of them aren't licensed for use in type 1 diabetes. Um, and the evidence suggests that when they are used, they give you, they do give you a drop in your HbA1c um, and your body weight, um, a significant drop. Um, and then also 
with that though comes the risk of, of ketoacidosis and you are two to four times more likely um, to have ketoacidosis, um, two to four times fold increase um, in likelihood of you having ketoacidosis if you if you are started on an SGLT2 and you're type type one if you have type one diabetes. So I think that that probably leaves us with that we need more evaluation of use of these medications in this population um, and there could certainly be some benefit going forward. Um, there was a similar question that came in around GLP-1s um, use of in type 1. Um, liraglutide and exenatide appear to be the only ones that have been studied properly here and that there were small reductions in an A1C compared to insulin alone and very significant body weight loss. So um, three kilos um, was shown in some of the studies. So three kilo body weight reduction. Um, so that was quite um, quite good. And then potentially, given that some of these medications, particularly SGLT2s, are now showing benefit in people who don't have diabetes for some of these indications. So in renal and in heart failure, if you had renal problems or if you had heart failure problems, these medications may be something that's looked at to be used just purely to manage those things and not necessarily to manage any glycemia or any insulin resistance issues. But we are not there yet. Um, and unfortunately, the evidence base is not strong. And so further study needs to be done on this. Um, would you um, would GLP-1s be safe to use if you were trying to conceive? That was a question that came through. Um, again, I had a good look at whether any of them would be. There appears to have been some evidence that in animal studies, there were some birth defects. Um, and for that reason, um, we would not use them in anybody trying to conceive. And because some of them can be quite long acting, um, we would want to stop them in advance of trying to conceive as well. So in sometimes months in advance of trying to conceive. So this is where um, good um, good um, preconception guideline for, for for women who are wanting to um, who are wanting to go ahead and 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 for pregnancy and that needs to then be then be discussed in more detail and a plan made for that together um so also i was asked about statins um, and the actual impact um, on cardiovascular outcomes specifically for people living with type 1 and this is an excellent question there is very little evidence actually um, surprisingly little evidence again so I had a good look into this and um, there was a subgroup analysis on the heart protection study um, which showed a similar risk profile to what you would imagine with a type with somebody living with type 2 so that's somewhat um, heartening but it wasn't um, it wasn't statistically significant The next question that we had through was asking whether I had any tips on managing complications anxiety. And a fear of long-term diabetes complications is really, really common, especially in people with type 1 diabetes. And even more so if people have been through a period of life where their diabetes management maybe hasn't been so great. It's really difficult to predict whether somebody will develop complications and to what extent those complications will play a role in their lives going forward. We do know that if somebody has had a high HbA1c for a prolonged period of time, that that does increase their risk of developing complications. But we know that on top of that, there are lots of other factors. So, for example, how old a person is and how long they've had diabetes and genetic risks that play an important role as well. So we don't know for sure what a person's risk of complications is ever going to be. But what we do need to think about is that degree of worry and whether it's helping or not. So for some people, having a small degree of worry about complications can actually be quite helpful because it helps you to feel motivated to keep up your diabetes management. Now, the problem is when that fear starts to actually get in the way of you living your life, if you're finding it's constantly making you anxious or if it's pushing you to the point of feeling overwhelmed and so maybe pushing you into something like burnout, then it's not helpful. And we need to think about how you can manage that fear. 
And so the number one thing to be asking yourself is, is this degree of anxiety helping me? Is it helping me to manage my diabetes in the best way I can? Is it helping me to have a decent relationship with my diabetes? And most importantly of all, is it helping me get on and live the life that I want to lead? And if the answer to those questions are no, then maybe it's time to think about letting go of some of that fear and doing some work on actually, is this fear realistic and helpful for me? A really useful area to explore could be acceptance and commitment therapy, which is all about being able to accept really difficult thoughts and feelings where they can't be changed, but also helping to increase the commitment that you have to doing the things that you need to do to live the best life you can. Russ Harris works with this kind of therapy and has written loads of books and done webinars on this. Um, he's a really easy way to get into acceptance and commitment therapy, which is also known as ACT. So I would really invite people to have a look at his stuff because it's really friendly and easy to look at. And the final question that we had through was about sleep and strategies that might help with sleep. So during these really strange times where routine has completely gone out of the window and there's a whole load of additional stress, it's really, really common if you are experiencing disrupted sleep or you're waking up earlier in the morning that you might normally do. There's loads of techniques that you can use to try and help with this. They all come under the umbrella term of sleep hygiene. So if you Google sleep hygiene, you will find a whole load of resources that might be helpful to you. Some of the basic things to bear in mind are things like trying to make sure that you don't have screens in your bedroom. So TVs, phones, iPads, get them out of your bedroom as much as you possibly can and try not to have any screen time at least an hour before bed because we know that that really impacts on sleep. So the first question is uh, from Goa Aman. I find no consistency in how my body reacts to the same unchanged exercise. Sometimes BT drops, sometimes goes up, sometimes nothing. It's so frustrating as I never feel confident that I've taken the right steps. What other factors am I missing apart from anaerobic, aerobic and duration? Uh, I guess the big one there is, is insulin on board as well. So making sure that you've not got a, a, a huge amount of, of insulin uh, active in your body. Um, because as soon as you start exercising, it's going to affect like turbocharge that that insulin, and you're going to end up with um, uh, having a hypo because you've got a, a huge amount of insulin pulling that that glucose out. Um, and I, I guess you've tried documenting, writing down your blood sugars, um, and looking out for patterns as well in those exercises. When we talk about unchanged exercise so there's not just anaerobic aerobic and duration so if we look further into anaerobic you've got um how a lot of people work out is is split body parts and isolated muscle groups so you've got things like um where well, you've got chest day you've got core day you've got arms you've got legs and all those different variations of anaerobic exercise are all going to have different uh different effects on your blood sugar as well so if you're someone that's really really into uh managing your blood sugar during those those different types of exercise what you probably need to do is start documenting separately as well so if you document what happened on chest day so I write down your blood sugar before um what you ate or didn't eat if you had a correction dose what happened during and then what happened after if you're struggling to look through and find patterns in that data that you've got take that to your diabetes team, to the dietitian or to the nurse and speak to them and say, look, this is what I'm struggling with. Can you find me some, some patterns or can you work out a routine together? Um, so yeah, don't, don't struggle on your own. That's what the diabetes team is, is, is there for. Second question is from uh, Thelma. Is it more difficult to exercise if you're on pre-mixed insulin? Uh, yes, it's more difficult. You can, uh, so, so we talked a lot about uh, temporary basal rates and adjusting your insulin for the meal that you had before. 
if you're on pre-mixed insulin, um, it's more difficult to, to work out what's happened with the dose that you've. The third question is, uh, should a type 2 diabetic use flash glucose monitoring to help manage hypos during exercise? Um, there's no reason why you can't. Uh, the I discussed it with the 101 group. Many people said that type 2 diabetics don't get funding for flash glucose or CGM in that service, um, but some, some said they do. Our, our team don't use uh, flash glucose monitoring for type 2 diabetics. Um, but one of the things that you can do if you can't afford to fund it yourself or you, you can't get funding through your team um, is try and make your, your own trend graph, which is essentially what you want from the flash glucose monitoring to look at what's happening with your blood sugars across the lines. Um, so test your blood sugar every 10, 15 minutes, plot it on a graph uh, and draw the lines in between. You can quite quickly get a, a, an, an idea of what's happening there during the exercise. But what I would say is if you're having hypos regularly, there's probably something that needs adjusting. So document it, write it down and take it to your team to, to try and find the pattern. Hi everyone, my name's Nusrat. I'm one of the diabetes dietitians as part of the Diabetes 101 team. Thank you so much for joining us on the webinar on the day. This is just a follow up of the questions um, and answer session. So I'd like to answer some of the questions that came through. So the first one was from Goher um, and he had asked about Daphne and whether it's been updated for managing protein and fats. So I think at the moment Daphne does not um, count proteins and fats. However, if you speak to individual centres that do do Daphne, and um, they can look into this for you. It may be that individual dietitians can still give you that advice outside of Daphne training because they are still dietitians. I know that some paediatric teens and adult teens are now starting to count for protein and for fat. So do speak to your teams. There has been some new evidence that has come out that sometimes um, counting a little bit of protein or fat can be helpful. And particularly for those people that may be following um, a lower carb or keto diet, etc., it might be that you do still need a little bit of insulin. So like I say, please do speak to your local centres for that information and someone would be in touch. Um, and if they don't do it, I'm sure they could put you in touch with someone who can. The next question is from Annabelle, and that's about Daphne and whether it's updated to encourage lower carbs. So Daphne is dose adjusting for normal eating, and it's one um, type 1 diabetes way of managing diabetes, and it's a course. So that's just one type of course out there in the UK that is taken up by a lot of different companies um, or departments across the UK, but it's just one way. Um, the carbohydrates within that are obviously just for normal eating um, as part of the normal government guidelines that currently exist for carbohydrates and it does include them. So at the moment I don't think it advocates the lower carbohydrate but if people want to follow a lower carbohydrate on the Daphne then that's fine. The next question um, is should people be looking to have a guideline amount of general daily carb intake? So. Um, the government at the moment does advocate for a certain amount of carbohydrates um, and currently that's between 200 to 300 grams a day and that differs so it could be lower at a lower end so if you're younger or if you're a child it can be higher if you're a teenager or under 18 and then it, it it's different for males and females so I'm not going to go into the exact details but it's around that much um, and if you want to look that information up in more detail you can go online and have a look at the um, government guidelines for that um, but around that around that value so 200 to 300 grams per day um, from the lower end um, so very low carbs or low carbs are obviously less than the 100 or a lot lower than that um, and the keto diet is even lower so at the moment we just the government does advocate for a normal one so my next question is about should people be looking to have a daily amount for general daily carb intake um, at the moment, the government advocates for around 200 to 300 grams of carbohydrates per day. That differs depending on, in, on if you're male or female, and it also differs depending on the age. So if you're a child of two to three years of age, that's going to be very different to someone who's eight or 10 or someone who's 60 or 70. Um, so it does vary throughout the lifespan. Um, and if you're a teenager, you might need a little bit more. Um, as an adult, like I say, the average is 200 to 300 grams that the government currently advocates. Um, generally speaking, I think most of us do have quite large carbohydrate portions and I'm sure if you're counting your carbohydrates, you know how much you're having per meal. Um, so if it's an, in excess of that, you know, we can all try and cut down a little bit where we can to be healthier. If it's 
very much lower than that than possibly for a healthy lifestyle and particularly if you're doing a lot of exercise you might need to increase your carbohydrates and um, obviously from a lower carbohydrate or a very low carbohydrate diet or a keto diet that carbohydrate intake would be a lot lower um, but it's not to say that I'm advocating that or not that you can't have that but from a healthy general living guideline around the 200 to 300 grams would be absolutely fine and it's a very healthy amount to be having. So my next question is from Neil who says um, changing to using a bolus adapter app was a game changer for me. Do you have any particular apps you would recommend? So there's, there's loads of apps out there and I'm sure depending on if you're on Android or if you're on iPhone there's going to be different ones available on the app stores etc. Um, there's a few out there that I'm aware of. So there's things like the My Sugar app, the Diabetes UK Tracker app, um, there's one called BG Monitor. Um, so there's plenty out there. Um, the best thing to do is maybe go on some comparison websites or have a look online to see what might be best for you. Um, some of these do include bolus um, insulin advisory techniques and some of them don't. Um, I know that a lot of the meters that used to be bolus adapters no longer are being produced. Um, so it's up to you and it's best to have a look and shop around I guess before maybe deciding on one. Um, some of them are probably free but others probably do ask for you to pay for them so um, have a look around. Um, but yeah if you're not using one it could be something that might help. Some people really like to track everything they do and keep an eye on it very um, detailed whereas others just want to not worry about it and not have to think about it and not have to track it. So however you work best it's um, up to you guys. But those are the ones that I would maybe have a look and then um, maybe have a look online to see um, diabetes apps and just compare those, like I say, to what you think might work for you. So my next question is from Jill and it says, um, it frustrates me that there are different messages around food and carbs, all different. For example, healthier you for pre-diabetes, expert, um, type 2 diabetes and then Daphne. So Jill, uh, so within that question, obviously, there's lots of different courses, as I've already answered earlier, you know, Daphne is one of those and Daphne is for type 1 diabetes. Um, so if you have type 1 diabetes or you're aware of the diabetes, it's, it's quite different and you are counting carbohydrates, you're trying to match what insulin you have to that food. As a type 2, um, you might be at a very different stage of your condition and it might be really early where you could have dietary changes and that could be enough to kind of put you back into remission maybe and delay that diabetes developing any further and um, you might be at quite a later stage where you are needing multiple tablets and insulin um, and but ultimately as type 2 you may still have some insulin in your body and in your pancreas so it's never an easy uh, method of managing that and there's different ones so expert is for type 2 diabetes and then the pre-diabetes um, like I say you don't quite have diabetes so there's very different ways of managing that so I can see why it would be frustrating but all of those are for different conditions as such um, and I'm sure you'll all agree with me that um, type 1, type 2, pre-diabetes you know type 3 if you've heard of that and 2.5 etc they're all slightly different modi you know and um, there's slightly different treatment for that so there's not just one method of managing that and i think that's good i think it's good to have a variety of methods of treating um different ways and i don't think we're all the same you know everyone wants to have a different diet and be unique to you whatever works for individuals so i think it's good to have a variety of methods of teaching um, rather than just one set method because um, then not everyone learns in the same way so I'm sorry you find it frustrating but at the moment like I say there's different types of diabetes and those ones that you've particularly mentioned are actually for different management managing different conditions so my next question is from um, diabetic dad so thank you for that um, and you've asked is there a way to accurately calculate GI for foods or is it trial and error and would um, you would love some sort of crib sheet for this. So ideally, best contacting your department or team, diabetes team, it might be that the diabetes dietitians have created um, a diet sheet on this or might have some sort of information written on this for you. Um, I'm aware that there is a BDA food fact sheet on glycemic index. It's not very detailed though, I think the detail you're looking for. There is also um, lots of information on GI out there so how GI is actually calculated is um, 
usually tracked on something called a GI database. So if you really wanted to go away and look that up, you could have a look on the GI databases. But then, as you have said, it really does on its own, that food on the GI database will be correct, but then depending on what you're eating with that, so if you're adding protein, if you're adding fat, depending on what other food is in that meal, um, it will alter the GI of that food. Um, so it is a bit of trial and error, I'm afraid. And as I talked about on the day um, of doing the talk that, you know, carbs, you could do the same thing every single day and it feels like you're eating the same meal, but you'll get a different outcome. So it really does depend on activity, illness, the temperature outside. Um, however, generally speaking, if you're using sort of CGM and you're monitoring the way you're eating and you're trying to do some sort of trial and error of roughly eating the same food every time, you will gen generally get some sort of a pattern. So if you eat pizza all the time, you know, you'll notice what happens to your blood sugars. So fingers crossed, you might be able to get some sort of trial and error on yourself and experiment to get an idea of what, how those GI foods in that combination works for you, if that makes sense. Um, and like I say, if you do contact your local team or diabetes team, they should be able to provide you some written information. Um, most departments will have um, some sort of information written, particularly on GI. So my next question is from Stacey and she's asked about, what are your views on counting, allowing for protein within your bolus? So I think I talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, there is evidence now that protein possibly can make a difference to your overall um, carb counting and can affect the GI of the food. So there is some studies out there that do say that depending on the amount of protein in the meal, it could affect your bolus. So there are some departments and uh, particularly peds and adults now advocating for this and counting it but you would need to speak to your individual departments and your individual team to see what they're doing. And if they're not doing it, to ask them to look into this for you and maybe be able to support you individually if that is something you want to do. So if you do particularly notice from my earlier question, if you've trialed an error and you're noticing that every time I have that with the big amount of protein and despite counting for all the carbs, it's still not quite accurate, then it will be worth discussing that with your diabetes dietitian or booking in for an appointment and saying, this is what you've noticed. And is it worth having that conversation? Um, there's a bit, always a bit of give and take, isn't there? Even if they're not doing that, it's something that they can work with you to do. So definitely have a conversation, book in um, and speak to them about what they're doing. And if they're not doing it, ask them to look into it is what I would say. Um, there is evidence out there for that now. And then my final question is from Paul. So thank you, Paul. Um, and it was about, do you have any rapid only insulin at all? Um, and you've he asked about being on mixed insulin previously and now he's on act rapid so you can snack more. So a lot of type ones, people with diabetes with type one tend to be on insulin that's fast acting with meals and then a longer acting that's a background. Um, type two diabetes, it can differ. So again, as I talked about earlier, if you're at the later stages where you are needing insulin for each meal and your pancreas isn't producing as much insulin, you might also be on fast acting insulin at each meal. So there's definitely insulins out there um, and there's different ones available. There's a current few that are used all the time in most departments, but because um, it's an insulin based question, it's probably one for the nurses. So best thing to do is to speak to your diabetes nurses or team doctor and speak to them about that. Um, and yes, it is handy if you're having a snack or if you're eating that you can take that. If you're also on mixed insulin, then you shouldn't be combining the two. So it would be worth speaking to your team is to, maybe you need to change the way you're taking your insulin. So if mixed insulin doses isn't working as well and you're finding that your sugars are going up, it might be that you need to take um, beyond a dose where you're taking a background and then an insulin for each meal. So you might need to change the way you're taking your insulin. Um, hope that's helpful. Thank you so much everyone for joining in and thank you so much for the questions. Um, any other questions, I'm more than happy for people to contact me on my Twitter account. Um, that's Nusrat KRD. Um, just get in touch, send me a question, send me a message. I'm happy to help. So thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity for presenting today. Bye guys. So thank you for the questions uh, from the conference. 
Um, uh, this uh, first one uh, was why are we not offering GAD65 uh, and C-peptide blood tests routinely? Um, if it was my uh, gift, I would uh, I would do this uh, at Diagnosis and others, uh, although it's deemed uh, not to be uh, cost effective uh, if done by uh, generalists. Um, so I suspect it's money. Uh, next question, if someone has had uh, type 2 diabetes for 30 years, none of the usual uh, uh, features of type 2 diabetes and has been insulin for much of this time, is it too late to review the diagnosis of it being potentially larder? Um, the, no, it's not too late. Um, it may be that it doesn't change the treatment, uh, but uh, because GAD antibodies, uh, which are typically elevated in LADA, um, uh, may actually have disappeared by now. But checking the C-peptide would actually give an assessment uh, in terms of insulin, uh, endogenous insulin production, that's insulin produced by the body. Um, Probably this is best done um, uh, after speaking to your uh, GP or specialist. I suspect if it's a GP, they may need to take further advice regarding this. Um, another question this time um, uh, uh, regarding uh, what he would recommend, uh, C-peptide. Uh, this is me, what I'd recommend it, uh, C-peptide or GAD65. Uh, GAD65 is one of uh, four autoantibodies. I'll, I think there's another question uh, regarding uh, this, but um, yeah, the, um, the others including islet cell antibodies, um, IA2 and insulin autoantibodies. Um, so typically if you're looking for a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, you would have abnormalities on one or more of those autoantibodies, particularly early in the disease. Um, the C-peptide, as I've mentioned before, actually measures endogenous um, insulin production, in other words, the body's uh, uh, ability to produce insulin itself. Obviously in type one diabetes, that's typically very low or even zero, uh, particularly after a number of years. Uh, next question is, is it time to abolish uh, and ignore uh, NICE for uh, diabetes of all types? And let's go with guidance produced by Patrick and Phil. I'm more than happy to contribute that. I can imagine some of my colleagues might not agree with my suggestions, but, um, uh, uh, yeah, I certainly uh, nice are looking at both the type one and type two guidance, and I think um, it, it's it's absolutely over time for both those to be reviewed, and uh, because there's a lot of things have changed, and of course there are many other types of diabetes um, uh, beyond type one and type two diabetes, which leads on to the final question, which is um, is there any possibility the names uh, can be changed given type one and type two are so different um, and and this would help with misdiagnosis some of the misunderstanding which I know causes distress to a number of people and, 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 and elements of stigma can also come from that my personal view I'd love them to change that I think it, it would be great if we could do that as you say we know a lot more there's a lot more to this business of diabetes than just simply sugar um, but uh, I suspect uh, we're so deeply ingrained in in terms of uh, uh, medical naming. I think it's really going to take almost a, a ground movement. So it's over to you guys uh, to actually uh, kick up a fuss and, and maybe um, there will be uh, a change here. But I, I'd be surprised if it's in my lifetime. Hi, my name's Alison. I'm an adult DSN and I'm just going to answer a couple of quick questions that came up during the recent Staying Safe in Hospital sessions as part of the uh, Diabetes 101 uh, tutorials. So the first question that came up was uh, to re regarding children and a paediatric question. Would I be able to stay with my child when they're in hospital? Yes, you are able to stay with them, but currently they're having to limit this to one parent or one carer per child due to uh, COVID. Um, whilst you're there, you would certainly be able to um, be involved in your child's care. However, if they're unwell, you may have to step back and allow the team to do this as they will be dealing with uh, some of the medical uh, conditions, parameters that you're unaware of. Also, um, you most likely will not be allowed in what we would call a sterile area, such as uh, a theatre space or some procedure rooms. 
Hi, the second question is to do with uh, closed loop systems. So the DIY closed loop systems that some of you are using and the question was, would I be able to use this in hospital? I think this ties in with insulin pumps as well. So if you are well enough, you can use these systems, you can use pumps, etc. Um, so going in for routine uh, procedures or operations, always check with your local team first to see what their guidelines are and perhaps get some instruction off them and even a letter that you can take with you to show the, the, the surgical team or the team that's doing the procedure for you so they understand what, how exactly you control your diabetes. If it's an emergency, then you, you most likely, certainly at the beginning, will not be able to use these systems as you may be too unwell to manage this yourself and they won't be able to manage the system for you. So we would have to take over your diabetes control uh, using either what we call a variable rate intravenous insulin infusion or it's more commonly called a um, a, a sliding scale to control your diabetes or an injection regime. Once you are well enough and able to take over your care again then you can convert back to your your own regime be that your own multiple injection regime, your closed loop system or your uh, insulin pump which may or may not be augmented with a sensor. But um, please always talk to the teams there. Talk to either your local team, if it's your local hospital, or if you've been unfortunate enough to have an accident, etc., and you've gone into a hospital you're not familiar with, ask to speak to the local diabetes team there who will be able to help you. OK, thank you. So I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of the speakers today. Um, they've all given up their time free of charge to give you your questions answered. Um, so if we can have a big round of applause on Twitter and um, have a lovely day. Hi, I'm Beth. I'm one of the DSNs from Team 101. I just wanted to say um, thank you so much for spending the day with us and watching all these videos and being part of the 101 Downloaded Conference. We hope to come back next year, bigger and better. Um, we're in planning mode and we've got lots of things planned. So we hope to see you again and we hope that you found it helpful. Bye.